for editing film. But you know, when we say that we're editing or cutting a film, we aren't really saying enough. Movies aren't just made on the set. A lot of the actual making happens right here. So a moviola like this is very nearly as important as a camera. Here, films are salvaged, saved sometimes from disaster or savaged out of existence. This is the last stop on the long road between the dream in a filmmaker's head and the public to whom that dream is addressed. Carlyle said that almost everything examined deeply enough will turn out to be musical. Of course, this is profoundly true of motion pictures. The pictures have movement, the movies move, and then there's the movement from one picture to another. There's a rhythmic structuring to that. There's counterpoint, harmony, and dissonance. A film is never right until it's right musically. And this moviola, this filmmaker's tool, is a kind of musical instrument. It's here that other film instruments are tuned and finally orchestrated. So if you find me winding up our conversation here, you'll understand that as a filmmaker, I'm speaking to you from my home. This is to be a conversation, certainly not anything so formal as a lecture. And what we're going to talk about is Othello, Shakespeare's play and the film I made of it. And that sounds rather arrogant, doesn't it? Just naming the two in the same sentence. The truth is, of course, that by any real standard of worth, Comparison is not merely impossible, it's absurd. The play is something more than a masterpiece. It stands through the centuries as one of the great monuments of Western civilization. You pick an arbitrary figure, 12. Name 12 plays which could be called great. Othello must be one of those 12. And of that 12, at least nine which is another arbitrary figure, are by Shakespeare. That leaves three in our list for all the other writers who ever lived. Is that putting it too strongly? Well, raise it to five. You can't go higher than that. And Shakespeare remains immortally number one. Among all dramatists, the first, the greatest poet. In terms of sheer accomplishment, very possibly our greatest man. So, where does that leave a mere movie maker? <laughs> Nowhere. Nowhere at all. Unless we leave out all comparisons and consider that my Othello, based upon, adapted from, and inspired by William Shakespeare's tragedy, has some little right to be considered on whatever merit it may presume to have as a movie, as a movie. And yet, if merits there be, this is not at all the conversation, or am I the conversationist to treat with them? Don't imagine for a moment that I'm pretending to be modest. It's just my fixed conviction that critical opinions about one's own work should be left to others. Is my movie Othello good or bad, flawless or flawed, a masterpiece or a mess? It's been vigorously, even viciously attacked, denigrated and dismissed, and also praised sometimes 
quite extravagantly. I don't know your opinion. And I won't tell you mine. But I can't help the movie by telling you it's good. And if I think it's bad, if I really do, I'd better not say so. Why? Because this movie is still being shown in theaters after almost 30 years. People are still going to see it, and I'll admit to feeling quite happy about that. Good or bad, there's still some kind of life in it, which is the reason I'd be sorry and, I guess, pretty foolish to do anything to kill it. Kill that life. And the fact that I've been asked to talk to you about it after all this time imposes upon me, I guess, a, a certain guarded respect for the subject. So, what I'll do is to tell you what I can, how the picture came to be made, for instance. I, I can tell you about that and how it, how it was made. To put it mildly, that was quite an adventure. It led us, before we were done to many strange and rather wonderful places in the world, into and out of more than one disaster, there were moments of sheer desperation and there was much delight. Escaping, therefore, from auto-criticism by means of autobiography, I will, to quote the Moor himself, a round, unvarnished tale deliver. Well, how to begin the tale? Where shall we begin? You might, you might say it all began in, uh, in Rome, in a Roman film studio with a Roman film producer named Scalera, who owned the studio. He wasn't going to own it for very much longer, but... <laughs> If anybody else knew about it, nobody bothered to tell me. Now, in those early post-war years in the Italian motion picture industry, Commandatore Scalera was still very much Mr. Big. He came on the set, he looked at me and said, Deviamo fare Othello. We've got to make Othello. I, I saw no reason to argue. As an actor, since my very earliest days, my first charted an optimistic course, I hope, would take me to some of the great roles in dramatic literature. Othello's always been among the highest of those aspirations. But why did Galera suggest that I should do Othello? Well, he loved opera. He was an opera buff, and he'd made a lot of opera movies, made a lot of money making those movies. And when he saw me, made up as I was for the role of Count Cagliostro in a gypsy makeup with curly hair and a big gold earring. He was thinking Verdi and not Shakespeare, and he naturally said, Othello, let's make Othello. But why did it happen in Rome? I, I didn't even want to be in Rome. I wanted to be in Paris. It was the wrong place and the wrong movie. I had been planning to do Cyrano de Bergerac. Now, there's a romantic part for you. But he has a nose. He can disguise himself under the funny nose. I was going to make Cyrano. I'd been working with Trauner on it for months in Paris. When suddenly, Corda, who was our producer, came to me and said, My dear fellow, I need dollars. I want to sell it to America. And he did. And Joe Ferrer played it and got the Academy Award. And that's the end of that story. Cagliostro was supposedly commercial, and it wasn't. It was supposed to make me rich, and it didn't. It was a result of a letdown, but if, well, here's an irony. I've been talking quite a bit, but too much, perhaps, about myself as an actor. It's because, as you've seen, it was primarily as an actor, rather than as a filmmaker, that I came to do Othello in the first place. But if that movie is still being seen, if it is indeed still worth talking about at all, it's, it's not, I must admit, primarily because of what I contributed to it as an actor. I was just reading a book on the subject of my Othello, preparing for this conversation with you this afternoon, and it quoted Eric Bentley, who said that I don't act, I'm just photographed. Those are the kind of things you'd ever forget. So maybe I was just being photographed in Othello after all that actor, actor's thinking and after all that nonsensical actor's ambition. It means it's high time for a word or two about Othello as a film.
Now, I won't venture into the territory of the critics. I promised I wasn't going to, but staying safely on my own side of the fence, what I can offer is a hint or two of what I was thinking of in terms of cinematic style and substance, or less pompously, what kind of film it was that I set out to make, what was thematic, what was planned, and what was accidental. In um, Olivier's Othello, which was a cinematic record of uh, the stage production, its core was the shocking spectacle of a man reverting to savagery eaten up by jealousy until he murders the woman he loves. My film, by contrast, tried to depict a whole world in collapse, a world that is a metaphor, not just for Othello's mind, but for an epic pre-modern age. And here I'm, uh, I'm quoting or misquoting to uh, not very good effect a critic, Jack J. Jorgens, who wrote a book on uh, Shakespeare in the films. I'm very grateful to him for what he said. I'm going to leave out the good things and the bad ones. Uh, there are also some other quotes that I'll refer to because it does sum up the intention behind the film. The, the visual style of the film mirrors the marriage at the center of the play, which is not that of Othello and Desdemona, but the perverse marriage of Othello and Iago. Part of the cinematic language is born of Othello's romantic, and here we come to that word, his romantic and his heroic nature, which we embody, I attempted to, and here it says that I did, uh, by vast spaces, monumental buildings, the sky, sea, and rocks, the brute fortress, and these walls, these vaults and corridors echo and repeat and reflect and multiply like so many mirrors the eloquence of Shakespeare's tragedy, at least that's the intention. Now, the grandeur and simplicity are the moors, the dizzying camera movements, the tortured compositions, the grotesque shadows and insane distortions. There are Iago, for he is the agent of chaos. In Shakespeare's verbal terms, Iago's masterpiece is to reduce Othello's lyricism to bursts of confused logic, shattered syntax, obsessive repetitions, and unconscious puns. Lie with her, lie on her. We say lie on her when they belie her, lie on her zoons and so on. I can't quote it exactly right, but it's a total disintegration. And uh, the attempt of our camera was to create that sense of vertigo, a feeling of tottering instability. Culminating, of course, in Othello's epileptic seizure, the murder of Rodrigo, and Othello's dizzying final fall. Now, in Venice, Iago's attempts to sow discord are frustrated. He's but a shadow on the canal, or a lurking whisperer, a threat, a possibility. The civilized order of Venice is embodied in rich, harmonious architecture, placid canals, and in the symmetrical altar at which Othello and Desdemona are married. In Cyprus, at the frontier of the civilized world, the restraints of Venice are lifted, art, luxury, and institutions are taken away. And the longer we're in Cyprus, the more the involuted Iago style triumphs over the heroic and lyrical Othello style in the film. Venetian. Christianity is overpowered by paganism. Christian images appear, but they're put to perverse use. Othello's killing of Desdemona is a dark ritual recalling the wedding in Venice, but now he puts out the candles at the altar. And sounds in Cyprus, wind, shouts, echoing footsteps, slamming doors. They become surreally loud, moving, Shadows distort the human figure. Characters are separated by tremendous distances, and yet there's 
An increasing feeling of confinement, ceilings bear down, walls become overpowering, the world seems to be closing in. In the play, one of Iago's favorite images is that of the net, the snare, the web, making him a fisherman, a hunter, a spider. With as little a web as this, will I ensnare as great a fly as Cassio, he says. And our camera holds that image before the camera's eyes and plays variations on it. We see it through the grate which Desdemona passes to escape her father, the net that holds her hair in Cyprus, the ship's rigging, the rack of spears, and the fortress, and the windows and doors, Othello's bedroom in the end. Iago is caught in his own mesh, always hovering above him as the iron cage where the sun will scorch him Goals will peck at his flesh. Again, my thanks to Jack J. Jorgens and to Andre Bazin, uh, whom I quoted in the midst of all that, or misquoted again. But now, having laid all that heavy stuff on you, I think I'd better explain how circumstance itself had a lot to do with the determination of our style. I, I should explain that as originally projected, we were going to shoot most of the movie in the south of France. We are going to work out of the old Victorine studios in Nice. This was the choice of the art director, my dear friend, Alexander Trauner. Now, you know, only a few true artists have emerged from or worked in that profession. Men like George Vakovich, Cameron Menzies, Vincent Corder, and Trauner is at the very least their peer. Well, we just finished working together for several long months preparing that Cyrano de Bergerac for Alexander Corder, which you remember was never made. And uh, we were working in various museums in Paris, especially in the fascinating Carnival of LA. And Paris was Trauner's city. Once you've turned your back on Budapest, the good old days, I guess, there wasn't any choice. Anyway, like many another Hungarian, Trauner was in love with France, and I really do think that's why we were there. Why not? Anyway, it's why I found myself rehearsing a cast of English actors in the Bois de Boulogne. That's why we were going to build the island of Cyprus on the Côte d'Azur. And why shouldn't we, after all? Cyprus. Cyprus, as Trauner painted, it was a grimly handsome fortress of a place starkly poised between... Veneto and Byzantium, and for our movie, much more right than anything real which might still be standing in this century. I say as he painted it because that's what he did. None of the usual architectural renderings, no mere colored sketches. Trauner, Trauner painted. He made pictures. Picasso was not frequently an enthusiast for the work of lesser mortals, spoke very highly of those paintings. I heard him. So everyone, of course, was very happy and pleased about shooting in the south of France. And that, that this, was, this was not to have been only for the Cypriot part of the story, but for Venice, too. And you can see why. If for three-fourths of our film we were to inhabit an invented world rather than a series of real locations, then our, ver then our version of reality would have been merely mocked by those famous and familiar old stones of Venice. There could be no stylistic integrity unless Venice too would be a Venice by Trauna, a city totally undeveloped by the tourist industry. So what happened to all that? The answer is Commandatore Scalera is what happened, or rather what didn't. Remember him saying, Deviamo fare Otello. Well, the arrangement for financing Otello had been, as he explained, for a Italo Francese co produzione. That's co production between Italy and France. But even as the first nail was to be driven in the construction of Trauna's Venise a la Nissoise, word was rushed to us that the French part of Scalera's construction had somehow collapsed. There was no more co to the produzione. We were now. Italian, 100%. We would be several other things, too, before all this was over. Time and chance and many, many of vicissitude would take us over half of Italy to England, with a mixing of the sound of Africa, especially to Africa, 
and specifically to Morocco. Now, Othello's story has nothing to do with his own native land, but our story was very much involved in it. We were all over Morocco, and in a minute I'll tell you why. Just here I'd like to mention how it came to pass that we entered the lists at the Cannes Film Festival under a Moorish flag. Appropriate enough, you might say, for a movie on the Moor of Venice, but uh, this, like so much else, was not a clever plan of mine, but uh, a mere whim of fortune. We started off, you remember, by losing the French part of our official nationality. At the end, we had no nationality at all. Othello was a movie without a country, which meant, of course, that there was no legal way to export or import it from anywhere to anywhere. At the festival, it meant that that pile of film cans that I'd come lugging into town with had no status and thus no chance of joining the festival, much less of winning it. Morocco then was a flag of convenience, like Liberia for a ship owner. I guess it's the first film, Othello, and certainly the last entry to the Cannes Film Festival had no national delegation. That was just me and those, those film cans. Well, we did well anyway. And here is how I found out that we'd won the grand prize and won it a little sooner than one is supposed to. I mean, found out sooner because officially that sort of news is uh, broken the way it is with Oscars, only when the winner is publicly named. But several hours before the big event, when I was up in my room in the Carl Hotel, sweating it out, waiting alone, there came to me somewhat breathlessly the big boss of the festival himself, and he looked distracted. He, he wasn't there to give out any information, but to get it. I don't know, he said, who else to turn to. My God, can you tell me what is the Moorish national anthem? The winner, you see, gets his anthem played for him when he takes his bow, and that's so I learned that Othello was the winner. I didn't know Morocco's anthem any more than anyone else, so the band played something vaguely oriental from one of the French operettes. The audience stood solemnly to attention, and with the international propriety thus observed, the festival officials could breathe once more. Well, that's an anecdote. But not, I think, a, not a mere digression, because it illustrates the sort of quandary which changed not just the lives of those of us who made the picture, but changed the style, the character of the picture itself. Maybe that has something to do with what we were praised for. In other words, mere chance, losing as we did. More than one nationality, and forced as we were to adapt ourselves to a whole series of sudden alterations and violent retreats, all sober planning had to be scuttled, and the making of the film, whenever there was money enough to continue, was pure improvisation. Trauner's beautiful paintings had to be abandoned right at the beginning, and by the end he made me a couple of walls and three pieces of furniture. We were never able to afford to build anything, so nothing was designed. Everything had to be found, hence all that globe trotting. Iago steps from the portico of the church in Torcello, an island in the Venetian lagoon, into a Portuguese cistern off the coast of Africa. He's crossed the world and moved between two continents in the middle of a single spoken phrase. In Othello, that happens all the time. A Tuscan stairway and a Moorish battlement of both parts of what in the film is a single room. Rodrigo kicks Cassio in Mazagan and gets punched back in Orvieto, a thousand miles away. And the jigsaw pieces were separated, not just by plane trips, but by breaks in time. Nothing was in continuity. I had no script, girl. There was no way for the jigsaw picture to be put together except in my mind. Over a span sometimes of months, I had to hold each detail in my memory, not just from sequence to sequence, but from cut to cut. And I had no cover. I had a whole series of cameramen because the delays while I went searching for money or took on jobs to earn it. The cameramen themselves found work, so I'd be picking up in the middle of a scene, even a sentence, with a new cameraman who'd seen nothing of what we'd done before. Well, of course, all that was bound to, a, to affect the shape and form and stylistic substance of the film itself. Half a year of careful planning had to be thrown away and a whole new conception built up virtually overnight. 
I was already in rehearsal with the actors when the news reached us. You see, working together hard over all those months, we designed a, a physical production in such a way that the entire picture would have been photographed in a relatively small number of camera setups. A whole scene, sometimes several scenes, would have been played without a single cut. But that method of shooting absolutely requires the full resources of the movie studio. You need sets that break invisibly apart to allow for camera movement. You need, well, <laughs> I go into it all. Enough to say that everything that sort of filming calls for belongs to the discipline and technology of the sound studio. But, but don't think I'm speaking against real locations. Oh, stone is better than cardboard. And our new real locations were just fine, as far as they went. <laughs> Let me tell you about the Turkish baths. Of course, I, I don't need to be told that there's no Turkish bath in, in Shakespeare, but there is in Michael McLeamore's fascinating book on the subject of our making the movie, which is called Put Money in Thy Purse. Uh, a quotation from the play, and very apt indeed it is, and very funny the book is tells a lot of our troubles and it tells for one thing how it happened that uh, we found ourselves at the beginning of shooting that is in the fascinating city of Mogador on the coast of Africa the Atlantic coast why were we there we were there because as I told you we had to have real locations and the best one we could find for Cyprus was naturally not Cyprus movies being what they were it was Mogador, way down there, with the marvelous long battlements on which a lot of uh, important material was photographed. But when we got to Mogador with our large Italian crew, it was an enormous one, under the distinguished uh, Anchisi Brizzi, one of the greatest of Italian cameramen. And uh, heaven knows how many people. There must be, must be 35 or 36 of them. And, our full complement of actors. There we were in Mogador, arrived by plane, checked into our modest lodgings, and they were indeed very modest, because that's all there was in those days in that town, and started to wait. We waited for our costumes, and they didn't come. Why didn't they come? They didn't come because, as it turned out, the Commandatore Scalera was broke. Mr. Big of the Italian movie industry had gone bankrupt while we were in a plane on our way from Paris to Mogador. We found that out after a while and we had no costumes. We had a lot of actors. We had an enormous crew and obviously the thing to do was somehow to make the movie. Well, I had a little money so I could keep us going for a week or two. In the meantime, some people scuttled around Europe looking for ways to sell portions of the movie to Cyprus or, or Venice or more likely Japan or Turkey or something and get a few thousand dollars advance. While that kind of frantic operation was going on, hoping to get more money, hoping to be able to put money in our purse and to be able to continue the movie. While we were sitting there in Mogador, uh, the idea came to us that maybe we could make our costumes, which had never been made in Rome, or if they had, were being held by the sheriff, that we could make our costumes by using the local Jewish tailors, of which there were several. There was a big Jewish uh, quarter in Mogador, and they lived, incidentally, very happily with the Arabs and in those happy bygone days. And so the Jewish tailors were hired and pictures of Carpaccio gentlemen and ladies were shown them and pretty soon the costumes slowly began to be made but they wouldn't be ready for 10 days. And what could we shoot? Well, that was the big scene of the murder of Rodrigo. And what can you shoot in a costume movie Without costumes, there's only one place you can possibly be. That is with a lot of people. If it's just two people, there's an obvious solution. But when there's a crowd of people, there's only one possible place where people can be nude. And that's a Turkish bath. So we invented the Turkish bath. No reason why not. There were Turkish baths then, rather more than there are now. 
And all we had to do was put towels around the heads of our characters and photograph them from the waist up. And we borrowed a lot of incense from the local cathedral and filled up the Turkish bath with steam. And the Turkish bath itself wasn't a Turkish bath, it was a fish market. So to the, uh, to the sound of puffing incense and to the smell of decaying fish, we made that, uh, oh, it uh, runs more than a reel and a half, that very uh, involved and adventurous sequence of the murder of Rodrigo. After that, the costumes began to get ready, and uh, we had a big army of people gathered all in armor, and you can't see because of the way it's photographed, but all the armor is made out of sardine cans, hammered out and hung around necks, believe it or not. The banners were homemade, too. Everything was homemade. And anyway, we got going. After a little while, the little money we were bay, we had saved and were able to raise ran out and we had to stop and then run to another part of the world and make some more of it and so it went. And the history of it all, as I say, is very divertingly to be found in Michael McLeamore's book. He's Iago in the movie and his book has been reprinted and I commend it to you. And now, I have some footage here, not from Othello, but about it. A few excerpts from a luncheon party, a reunion, really, between three old friends. Michael McLeamore on the left and Hilton Edwards next to him. Edwards uh, played Brabantio uh, in the film That's Desdemona's Father, and McLeamore, of course, was Ariago. Some time has passed since then, <laughs> a quarter of a century. More. We've been friends a lot longer than that. We heard the chimes at midnight. I should explain that Edwards and McLeamore are together the founders and directors of the famous Gate Theatre in Dublin. If you love the theatre, then you know all about the gate, and if not, there's not much I can say about it, so I'll just begin, because there's too much to say, and I wouldn't know where to stop. Let me just say that these two men together have written, and as I speak, these words are still writing theatre history. And then, having dismissed their immense achievement with a single phrase, I'm going to take a bit longer on the subject of myself. The subject of this program, or whatever you may call it, being as it is my own film of Ocello, there's no way I can think of to avoid these lapses into autobiography. I'm obliged to tell you that the Gate Theatre is where I started my professional life. I was just a boy, and Hilton Edwards was still a very young man, but he was already a master. Since then, as an actor in the theater and radio and films, I've worked for what must be hundreds of directors. Some were good, some middling good. Many, of course, were mediocre, if not downright bad. And a few, two or three, perhaps, could be called great. Of these, Hilton Edwards was easily the first, and certainly was the best of teachers. God only knows that asking him to play Brabantio in the picture was a feeble enough indication of my gratitude. Hilton is also a distinguished actor, and Brabantio, God only knows, is an undistinguished part. The truth is that he came along with Michael to keep us all company and help out with the crowd scenes, and he kept a sharp director's eye on just about everything, and after the day's work was over, we'd hash it all out together burning the night away with talk. Well, here, 25 years later, is a bit more of the same. Some 46 years ago, when I first joined his theater, Michael McLeamon was playing his first Hamlet. By general consensus, one of the finest in living memory, surely the best I've ever seen. He's played it often since. I've, I once produced him in America, and he's played Iago since since he did it in my film and played it very differently. He's also played Othello and that often and differently and with Hilton Edwards as his Iago and his director. And I mention these things so you will appreciate how well our two luncheon guests are equipped for this discussion. I also believe, you know, that every Shakespeare play, there was one sort of other theme, a sort of simpler one. And I 
have a feeling that in the fellow it was the question of the black man and the white woman because although we know that the moors uh, were really yes. arabs yes but they were black and moors they were black and moors yeah, were considered to what black fortunes up the thick lips oh etc to my mind it was the black man in shakespeare's mind and the white woman that was the nub of the problem but does shakespeare give us the ordinary jealous husband no he gives us an extraordinary outsider. In other words, he gives us a foreigner, a glamorous uh, and strange savage, however he's played, and there are a thousand ways of playing him. And you were too young and I was too old. Oh, no, I don't think you... <laughs> you weren't too old. You weren't old at all. You weren't 28 years old, which is what Shakespeare says Iago is. Uh, but that doesn't matter at all. Well, so... The age of Othello, I'll admit that's, that's a fault of the film. It's a fault of my performance. I should have been older when I made the film because I would have known more about the part and I should have seemed older. I should have played it older. I think, I think it's true that Othellos in general should play Othello as older than they usually do because age is, first of all, it's indicated in the text and secondly, it distances Othello and Desdemona and anything that does that to age, race, or culture, any of those things are very, very important to the drama. But uh, Iago, if I'd let uh, the fact that you weren't precisely Shakespeare's age for the role be a consideration, I... Ridiculous. I would have denied myself an extraordinary performance. But, uh, no, that... That isn't flatter, it's, it's the truth. Uh, but we come to um, Iago's character and uh, the whole question of uh, what does Coleridge call it, the motiveless malignancy of Iago. We played him, I had that idea of uh, the impotence. It was really not so much a, a key for the audience as a clue for our performance, a way to justify a certain reading of the role. And my idea was that he was impotent. Yep. Yep. Yes. There's nothing in the script to contradict your theory. Therefore, we're free to do it once. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great thing about Shakespeare. And it's a downward motive. It, 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 I don't work. know that. I haven't the theory myself that Iago was evil, as I think we won't any of us uh, argue about that. No. That evil, like art in the fantasy period, was for its own sake. But it was an evil of, as we see when we see a cat catching a mouse, or a, or a cat playing with a rabbit or something, or a snake. Right? What looks evil to us and is not evil it's not to them is quite natural. But that's, that's what's so terrifying, and that's, that's what's an interesting so idea. In other words, you are saying that it is possible to have an unmotivated villain. We don't need Dr. Freud at all. There is no, such a thing. There is a natural boy. A natural love of evil. Yes, and a, a new natural it. pleasure of delight. Of and all the efforts mm. of the theorists, all the hair doctors who've written the books, yes. and all the directors like myself who've tried to find reasons, yes. are, are probably wasting their time because I life presents us on every I'm hand. I'm quite happy about that. You yes, know? I, I think that. Uh, Although there's no question that there is... Don't be polite to us. Come right out. There's, a, there's a feeling that there is a motiveless feeling of evil. But I've got a kind of feeling there's nothing without a motive. And in spite of what the scholars may say, I have great faith in that Shakespeare, having, as you say, your great instinct in, in acting, is very is, is even greater than what you learn classically. I think that Shakespeare was a much more direct person, a simpler person than we knew writing from his unconscious mind. And I think the theme of jealousy will support us through this argument. We have Othello being made jealous of Cassio. Now, what is he made jealous by? He's being made jealous by a jealous man. We have Iago, who is jealous of Othello, being in a superior position to him and being a black man, whereas he's a white Venetian. He's also jealous of Cassio, there's no question about That's that. Very well because recorded. Cassio, you know, Cassio is given the superior position, and all route you see that he, in that awful night, on the voyage, yeah. on the, no, but on, on the night uh, in, in Cyprus, he sees to it that uh, uh, Cassio is stripped of his, uh, of his, uh, of his, um, of his, 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 of his,
To me, the great thing is all the way through the you, play. You, you, the you, jealousy, jealousy. How does jealousy. that apply to Brabantio, the part you play? Oh, well, I think Brabantio is jealous yes. that anybody uh, should be loved by his daughter more than he is. I think this is the Fair only the jealousy. I, this is a In other words, it's like you can support the theory. I think it really is the theme of the play. I think you can, I, for me speak, mind you, I'm not very subtle in these ways, and I think it's quite enough for me. I get an impression of a whole community here which is poisoned by a, by a nap sting or a bee sting, if you like, of jealousy to some in, in, very, one of them. In, in varying degrees to every one of them. And this is why I would say that, to, as you originally suggested, that if there was a main theme for the play of Othello, I think one would say that jealousy suffices to motivate all the action through, throughout the play. Iago is the mystery of that play, but you know, they say many people I know who read their Shakespeare and, and not fools and so on has seen their Shakespeare, sometimes acted in their Shakespeare. So there's no such person as Iago. I have met him. Of course. Three times in my life. I've met him. You're man. lucky to have only met him thrice. Ha ha ha! One real life Iago is enough in any one life. I guess we've all met several of them, but I guess we are all agreed, aren't we, that uh, this noble play, this noble tragedy is essentially concerned with the most ignoble of all passions. Isn't that what jealousy is? The most humiliating, the most agonizing, and the most piteous. I think except self-pity and not a despised. That isn't a passion, is it? It's a disease. It is the result of a passion. It's the result a of a passion, yes. yes. It's also more terrible now by being out of fashion. <laughs> Do you really think that in this permissive age we're going to do away with jealousy? I don't, I don't think so. But why, why do we laugh at jealousy? Do we? I don't. No, I don't either, but people do. Ah, but who are people? The public. That sound, that, that, those are harsh words, sir. Thank God for them. Thank God for them, but, but we don't think as they do, or we wouldn't be up on the stage painting our face and pretending we were somebody it's else. It's the hurt head, <laughs> or not. It's the hurt head that everybody else is. It's that longing to be somebody else that drives us on the stage. Of course it does. Or it's the cockerel with the dragging plumes that everybody else has been dying to avenge himself upon. He sees the plumes dragged in the mud and they all come <laughs> down on him like that. That's the part of their laughing at jealousy. Never for the grace of God go I. You don't laugh at jealousy. Oh, no. no I, I don't even laugh at seasickness. I regard jealousy as the seasickness of passion. Much as I dislike to admit the feeling of jealousy being not a comic reaction in my mind, but a tragic one, it's more thing to say that when I think of women being jealous, I am so curiously less moved. I, I'm, I'm ashamed of this. And don't it's never been treated as a tragic subject no. in literature, has it? No. A liter uh, uh, in uh, dramatic uh, woman? literature? I don't think so. No, I would say that the reason for that is that all dramatic literature that we know about has been written under patriarchal uh, and male-dominated societies. Mm -hmm. For males, for males, in which the final decision in all matters belongs to the male. Mm -hmm. What can be the problem of a woman, if she is jealous or not, since she is owned? No, therefore I should be sympathetic with the public attitude at laughing at the cuckoo. I'm not so Because the public is partly female, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the public sees the essential yeah. comedy yeah. in the situation yeah. of, 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 of jealousy. Because of other females? Yes, and because women, when they are jealous, and we just asked one now in between takes what she would think, and she said, yes, I would be jealous, but I would translate it immediately into hate. Hatred. You see, but you know, fellow who is a do... perfect male type, yes, yes. kills Desdemona, adoring her. Worship. Now, isn't that male? It is indeed. Isn't that enormously yes. masculine yes. Yes, to murder this girl, yes. adoring her? No woman would do that. She, she would forgive. She would forgive the man or forget his crime or kill him. But she would never kill him, loving him. Man, that, that is the peculiar hypocrisy, poetry, and absurdity of the male condition. The implication is the man kills where he loves, the woman can only kill where she hates. Remember this, is, it seems off the beat. Maybe it is, I don't Close know. Close it. Go on. 
But Jean Cocteau said, whereas the blind man is a tragic figure on the stage, the deaf man is a comic one. You know, that Oedipus, yes. tragic. How one laugh, laugh, laugh is funny. And there's no difference. No. But you meet a blind man and meet a deaf man, and the deaf man is much more tragic in real life. Of course he is. He's cut away entirely. He can see everybody and he, he can't communicate. He can't. It's the parable, uh, isn't it, then? Uh, that is right. Then, then it, it, it's the it, only point. It, it proves the point very well. It shows that the point of absurdity, which is the difference between comedy and tragedy and the question of jealousy and between the woman and the man's attitude, is in itself without any logic, whatever. As long as the woman is any form of slave, mm. her role in drama is always going to be very limited. I'm not speaking about whether she should have it or not. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not all, coming on as woman. Yet all lives, the best parts in plays about lovers, rich lovers, Tristan, Nezala, Romeo, and Juliet, would be like, it is the woman's part. Why? Because there's nothing more fascinating to play than the slave. And gets more sympathy for the audience for all innately slave fearful. Oh, because this most depressing, a most depressing physical, basic reason for that. Because the man is responsible for the pleasure in physical love making. Yeah. She is not. Yeah. He is responsible. And he can't have his failure. That is the tragedy, comic and uh, and otherwise. Never heard. But does she There's not something funny about about a woman failing? I was thinking of Othello's own view. Uh, what made him jealous in in Desdemona, though she was as innocent as the day, and but he was poisoned by Iago, right? He must have been, been poisoned by more than Iago. He, he was take poisoned it by his overwhelming passion for the beauty and purity of this girl. They were both inseparable from his mind, and he denies the fact that he's going to be made jealous by these little 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 drops of minor poison that Iago is dropping into him. And he says, it is not to make me jealous to say my wife is fair, feeds well, loves company, sings, plays, and dances well. Tell a character about that. Where virtue is, these are more virtuous. And then he gets this nightmare again that she's in Cassio's arms. In the Haven't arms. you put your finger on the whole thing? Not that we are dealing with the Puritans. Over and over again, Othello speaks of her virtue. The fact that she's fair, all the rest of it is secondary. It's her virtue, and that's very much a Puritan preoccupation, isn't it? And Shakespeare understood that preoccupation. He was anything but a Puritan, but he understood them. After all, other people had closed his theater eventually, but they, I don't mean to say that Othello is one of those fellows in a funny hat, uh, but the, the Puritan idea, the Puritan strain runs through the English character from... Oh, from early days, long before the Puritan ascendancy, and that kind of Englishness is in the Moor's character. That preoccupation with purity as an abstract idea. Another thing he can't forgive her is what the 19th century theater always forgot in her. Desdemona is one of the most interesting characters to me, strangely, in the, in the whole wonderful, terrible play is that she is not the little pious, dream, obedient dreep that she was conceived of in the 19th century. Particularly. Not at all. She's anything but a Venetian girl who would walk out with a Negro and marry him. Oh, uh -huh, no. Now, certainly, uh, Desdemona's no cringing blonde. She's not a born loser. And if, if she dies a loser, it's no fault of hers. But, hey, just a little quibble here. We've been... Returning constantly to the idea that jealousy is the central theme of the play, but isn't there another nuance and perhaps something else entirely close to but different? What about envy? But don't you think that uh, perhaps is a distinction? But to me, there is a great and, distinction. And that what Iago feels, for example, uh, for Othello is envy, envy. of his position. Envy, envy of his position. It's and just just Othello is a torture by jealousy. Yeah. So envy is what? Isn't envy something you, you, you wish you could have, and jealousy is something you fear you are losing? Oh, right? so I think I heard you express it once as saying that uh, 
envy was the desire of having, and jealousy was the the, the pain of losing. Or fear of the fear of losing. Because you don't you, you could be jealous for no yeah. reason. And yet the curious thing is oh, I, I suppose you lose it the minute maybe maybe one is maybe one loses something the minute one is jealous even though there is no infidelity. I think there's a certain Isn't that perhaps could the moral in a certain terror use a terrible word of umbrella. Could be in the if there's the noble feeling about being envious, but there's not the same terrible heart rending humility yes, as yes. there is in jealousy. I agree with that you. awful feeling demeaning. Demeaning, demeaning that feeling it lowers one to the well I think Rochefort has said it somewhere or other that lots of times he's pointed about the most humiliating of all the all the feelings. This other it's a feeling of self unworthiness, a feeling of inadequacy, of almost failure. A the pleasure of the pain. The Isn't there something narcissistic? I was going to say the pleasure of putting the tongue upon the painful tooth. Yes. You know, that hurts one and it's pain. Yes, I think there is that. And there's all, I think there is. And doesn't Othello express it, sir? With so pity. Oh, we, oh yeah. I wish I could agree with you that there is some even faint perverse pleasure in the feeling of jealousy. I have known it. I didn't say there is, because I don't, I have never You're known it. You're wondering, was there, yes? But it isn't worse than that, isn't there a kind of self-love involved in jealousy? I think so, but there is self-love involved in every human emotion. Yeah. That's how it begins and that's how it ends. We're all ignoble savages, I think, really, you know. And whether we're black or white or Moorish or, or black or Moor or Spanish or Venetian or whatever it is, self-love is the beginning and the end of the human tragedy, I think. I agree entirely with you. You do agree? Oh, yes. Then I must be wrong. <laughs> I was only wondering, I, I, I have been terribly jealous in my life of you. I have, yes. Yes. And isn't it about the worst experience? The worst experience, I know. I agree, experience. and yet without mentioning names, the person I envy most, I have no feeling of bad pain about it at all. I envy, without mentioning any names at all, as I can think of two people that I envy. That now we're long, you know, it can be. Well, I mean, you know, if you go on like that, you might even tell you, and that'll ruin everything. However, who? I, well, I envy Michael his languages. I envy oh. Michael his certain oh, well, well, you well, might envy well, any well, I, envy, I, envy. I, envy, I envy you, your capacity. You described it to me years and years ago as another actor, and you said he had a wonderful capacity for displacing air. Ah, now, believe great. you me, no greater cubic capacity of air has ever been displaced by any human <laughs> being as is being displaced by you at this moment. <laughs> but you, you said something of the sort to me when I auditioned for you. 300 years ago. You also answered. I was a bloody bad actor. No, but, no, but I, always, I always knew you were a potential. You're a politician. You're in the Congress, and you wish you were in the White House. That's envy. You think the president is making love to your wife? That's that's jealousy. But he cannot be. He cannot be disallowed from a desire for possession. It's awful awful desire to entirely possess her and justify what is. If I might coin a phrase, each man kills the thing he stumps. Yes. <laughs> and, and if you got uh, as, as Othello did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just uh, going back in my mind to that, uh, that business of Othello's age and wondering how many other mistakes, how many other misinterpretations I was guilty of that you were too nice to mention during the shooting. There was never one direction you gave me with which I disagreed personally. Never one. Oh, well, that's bad. Never one single one except take the cloak and go. Oh, yes. I, I think I'd better explain. That's a family joke. There was a scene in which uh, you were supposed to take up your cloak and, yes, and go. And I disagreed passionately. And what the... I wanted to make the most of that. <laughs> Uh, well, yes, whenever I wanted to uh, to simplify the action or the business or whatever it was to eliminate superfluous decoration, I just repeated that privately famous line. Will you take the cloak and go? That's all you have to do, you said. Which you did eventually, and very nicely, too. Let's drink to that. Well, here... Yeah. Our luncheon party comes to an end. We didn't run out of food or wine. We certainly didn't run out of talk. 
We just ran out of film. Why, I wondered, does McLeamore say that Iago is a mystery? But what he means, I think, is that the Shakespeareans often call him that. And what worries them, I think what worries all of us, is the mystery of evil itself. You know, there's a tendency today to deny the existence of evil, not to believe in it, to call evil sickness. And you'll say, I suppose, that our notion of playing Iago as sexually impotent is a very modern sort of trick. Well, if it is a trick, I hope it isn't. At least we did impose it very heavily on the film itself. Now, I do believe quite fervently in the existence of evil, and certainly Shakespeare did, and just as certainly Iago is the embodiment of evil, more so even than Richard III, whose actions were evil, but who was motivated by ambition. Iago has no ambition. He hates Cassio, that's true for having been given a military title that he might have had, but uh, he would have hated him anyway. His envy, all of his brand of jealousy, is an excuse of Cassio, he says. There is a daily beauty in his life which makes me ugly. You see, Iago is a slave. He has the heart of a slave. He has the special cunning and the, all the artful hypocrisy of the slave who revels in the condition of slavery. Dostoevsky says... The secret consciousness of power is more insupportably delicious than open domination. And Iago says, we cannot all be masters, nor all masters cannot be truly followed. The irony is satanic. The whole key to his character, I think, and another key comes again from Iago himself, who says, I am not what I am. All the other people in the story are people of feeling. Iago is the intellect. He is pure intellect, and as Emerson says, pure intellect is the pure devil, pure and cold. Iago's is the terrible alliance of pure intellect and hate, and this is damnation. The worst of all hells in Daddy's Inferno is the hell of vice. Iago, of course, is incapable of love. He's forever protesting his love for Othello, to Othello, and Othello believes him. He is, after all, honest, honest Iago. Those words, honest Iago, are heard often. The word honest is heard even more often. Everybody speaks it in the play. Everybody describes Iago as honest. Desdemona does, Cassio does, Othello does, and Iago does interminably. Point is that Othello, believing Iago, believing him honest, believes his blameless wife is dishonest. It's a supreme irony. But I think it's easy enough to understand when you think about it. Desdemona, after all, comes from the gilded, pleasure-loving, luxurious world of Venetian aristocracy, about which uh, Othello knows absolutely nothing except that its morals are notoriously loose. He's a professional army man, after all, a stranger in the society of high-born, high-spirited, noble women. He's married one of them. They've just married. Now, that point's very important. They're just married. He scarcely knows her at all. Indeed, he never comes to know her. She dies in his hands, a stranger. They're strangers to each other. But Othello knows or thinks he knows Iago very well. And before anything, remember, Iago is honest. His slandering of Desdemona is done with great subtlety. He has nothing apparently to gain by it. So there really isn't any reason to speak of Othello as, as some critics do, as childishly gullible. No, Desdemona for Othello is the bride in a romance, a dream. He scarcely had time to discover what's flesh and blood before Iago's poisons have begun to work and to turn the dream into a nightmare. And Iago is a trusted officer in Othello's command, remember, a companion under arms, a fellow soldier, a fellow male. 
And Othello is monumentally male, and his story is monumentally a male tragedy. Small wonder that the doubt falls where it usually does in life. Not on the slanderer, but on the innocent object of the slander. Oh, there is certainly a huge simplicity about Othello. But in trusting Iago, he does no more than anyone else in the story. They all trust him, as we've seen. No, the commander of the armed forces of the great Venetian Republic is no stupid child. He is no Venetian sophisticated either, and I think he must feel something close to awe in his love for Desdemona, the senator's daughter, who fled from her palace in the dead of night to marry a black man. Black Othello, the outsider, the mercenary, the foreigner, and the older man must feel a certain insecurity when he contemplates this curious conquest of his. He is married her, as if by a miracle, but can he keep her? Might she not turn away from him as suddenly as she ran away with him? And now, just for a moment, I'd like to quote from the play itself. Othello, along with Iago, as he's first beginning to doubt, says, I swear, tis better to be much abused than but to know a little. What sense, said I, of her stolen hours of lust? I saw it not, thought it not. It harmed not me. I slept the next night well, fed well, was free and merry. I found not Cassio's kisses on her lips. By the world, I think my wife be honest and think she is not. I'll have some proof. My name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as my own face. I would be satisfied. And Iago says, how? How satisfied, my lord? Would you, the supervisor, grossly gape on? Behold her tapped. It is impossible you should see this. Were they as prime as goats, as hot as monkeys? Give me a reason, says Othello. Give me a living reason she's disloyal. I do not like the office as Iago, but Sith, I am entered in this cause so far, pricked to it by foolish honesty and love. I will go on. I lay with Cassio lately, and being troubled with a raging tooth, I could not sleep. There are a kind of men so loose of soul that in their sleeps will mutter their affairs. One of this kind is Cassio. In sleep, I heard him say, Sweet Desdemona, let us be wary. Let us hide our loves. And then, sir, would he gripe and wring my hand, cry, oh, sweet creature, then kiss me hard, as if he plucked up kisses by the roots that grew upon my lips. Lady's leg or my thigh, and sigh and kiss, and then cry, Cursed fate that gave thee to the moor. Ah, then at the beginning, the beginning of the play, the beginning of the love between Othello and Desdemona, there's the famous speech to the Senate which I think explains a good deal and tells us a lot about Othello himself, as well as that love. He's brought to the Senate, charged by Desdemona's father with the crime of having seduced Desdemona by magic spells. And this is what he says to the senators. Most potent, grave and reverend seniors, 
my very noble and approved good masters, that I obtain away this old man's daughter is most true. True, I have married her, the very head and front of my offending, at this extent no more. Rude am I in my speech, and little blessed with a soft phrase of peace. For since these arms of mine had seven years pith, till now some nine moons wasted, they have used their dearest action in the tented field. And little of this great world can I speak, more than pertains to feats of broils and battles, and therefore little shall I grace my cause in speaking for myself. Yet by your gracious patience, I will a round, unvarnished tale deliver of my whole course of love. What drugs, what charms, what conjuration, and what mighty magic for such proceeding am I charged with all? I won his daughter. Her father loved me, oft invited me, still questioned me the story of my life from year to year. The battles, sieges, fortune that I have passed, I ran it through, even from my boyish days, wherein I spoke of most disastrous chances of moving accidents by flood and field, of ever escapes in the imminent deadly breach, of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery, of my redemption thence, and portents in my travels history, or in of entries vast and deserts idle, rough quarries, rocks and hills, whose heads touch heaven. It was my hint to speak. Such was my process. And of the cannibals that each other eat, the anthropophagi, and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders, these things to hear were Desdemona, seriously inclined. But still the house affairs would draw her thence. Whichever as she could with haste dispatch, she'd come again. And with a greedy ear, devour up my discourse, which I observing found good means to draw from her a prayer of earnest heart that I would all my pilgrimage dilate, whereof by parcels she had something heard but not intentively. I did consent, and often did beguile her of her tears when I did speak of some distressful stroke that my youth suffered. My story being done, she gave me for my pains a world of sighs. She swore a faith to a strange, to a passing strange. It was pitiful. It was wondrous pitiful. She wished she had not heard it. Yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. She thanked me, and she bade me if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story. And that would woo her. Upon this hint I spoke. She loved me for the dangers I had passed. And I loved her, but she did pity them. And that's the speech. Now, uh, last winter, they invited me to Boston for a special showing of the film of Othello. The audience stayed on after the screening. A movie has to have a great opening. It must command attention. The opening of Othello is written for an audience that's just getting quiet. And like all openings in a play, because you don't ever want to open a play uh, at the top of your bent. But a movie should open at the top of its bent. It must, because this damn thing is dead. The only living thing are the people sitting out here. It's a projected image. And you cannot bring the thing alive unless you seize the people at the beginning. 
the riderless horse has to come in. And the funeral of Othello and the lynching of Iago is the riderless horse. Just as simple as that. May I ask a question which at first blush may sound silly? Um, is Roderigo's dog a terrier? <laughs> well, the reason I ask, well... Yes, why are you asking? Well, you see, if you consult Jan van Eyck's Arnold Feeney marriage portrait, you find, in addition to the circular mirror which you used in this film, that a terrier is a symbol of marital fidelity, and it seems to be at the heart of the film. And I was wondering if that was why you selected such I'd a like dog. I'd like to repeat, this is the kind of a question I love, uh, because if I'd known about the question before, I would have been able to pretend no. that I had indeed used the terrier because it is a classic symbol of marital infidelity. Fidelity. Since, uh, oh, fidelity, that's just what I've said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but since I didn't have notice of this question, I haven't got time to con you, and I'll have to tell you the truth. The terrier was uh, not a terrier. It was a Tenerife, which is a very rare kind of dog, because it is the dog, the lap dog, used by the dandies in all the Carpaccio paintings. And Carpaccio was the source of the costumes and the general aesthetic of the movie. That's the answer to that one. I was wondering, sir, in Olivier's production of Othello, he seems to stress the vanity of the man much more than in your production. I was wondering if you'd comment on that. Yes, but you see, Othello, the themes of Othello are set down for us by Shakespeare. And, uh, of course, there is a difference in every Othello, depending on who makes the film or the theatrical production, because there are so many ways of doing it. There isn't one right way of doing it. Uh, if I could make Othello again, first of all, as I say, I've done it in the theater since then, and I did it completely differently as an actor as well as a director. We took an entirely new uh, line on everything, because that's the great opportunity that you have the minute you have a great piece of material like a Shakespearean play or any other thing of that kind, you are free to make almost anything you want of it. Uh, you could go so many directions and still be true to the, to, uh, the essential job. Yes, sir. The motives of Iago in this production of Othello seem somewhat straightforward to be largely envy. But in some of your other movies, specifically Lady from Shanghai, the motives of Elsa Bannister seem much more obscure. We have, nobody ever works in a big organization, whether it's military or business or theatrical or anything else without running into a few Iagos. Uh, uh, now, there are all kinds of ways of doing it. Uh, when Olivier did uh, Iago with Richardson years ago, they did it as a homosexual relationship. And when, um, when Othello, played by Richardson, then fell into his fit, uh, Iago kissed him passionately on the lips. I don't know how that worked, but I know that they did it. And there are all many different efforts. In the case of this film, I took the line that Iago was impotent and that his malice was the malice of impotence. Something else. Sir, you took the set design from your Harlem Theater Company's stage. How do you know that? Because I taught a course on your films <laughs> a few years ago. You used the set design from the Harlem Theater Company's staging of Haiti. Uh, Only the of, basic uh, Macbeth, plan, not the you, set, not the set design. Just you, the basic you set plan. it in Haiti, right? And you eliminated yeah. the palm trees. Uh, from the, uh, the film set. It wasn't that simple. It wasn't that simple? No. Okay. No. It, well, all right. I was just wondering why you uh, chose to make that a one-shot experiment and never repeat the effort of making a film quickly, as you said, to inspire others to tackle difficult projects in a exactly. short amount of time. The, the, I don't know if you all heard that in the back. The, 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 the point is uh, that Macbeth, which was uh, uh, made in very short time. It was actually the actual principal photography was 19 days with two days more for inserts and things like that. So it was a real quickie. And uh, the basic set had the same plan, which I had used in the black 
Macbeth, which I had done in Harlem in the theater some years before. It wasn't the same set, but it had the same basic plan because uh, it worked before and uh, we were in a great rush. And the question was, why have I not repeated the experiment of making quickly serious or difficult subjects like Shakespearean plays? And the answer is that I was gambling on Macbeth being a great success. The American critical press for Macbeth was very bad at the time. Uh, the European press was very good. When you've got the film shot and you're sitting in the editing room or wherever it is, you're putting all these little bits of, of film together. Can you tell us, like, what is the question that's going through your mind as you, as you select things? What, what um, are particular questions for each scene? Uh, makes you select uh, one shot over another or as you're, as you're having the camera pan through a room or something, you want to cut to somebody's expression or, or whatever? I have, I have done a great deal of that editing while I'm filming. I visualize the editing while I'm filming. And when I change that idea, it is a deliberate change. Between um, that which you, you preconceive you know, before you shoot and that which you actually do after you the shoot. The difference is bigger than I'd like to admit. Well, you admit. And I do admit, yes. The difference is pretty great. Because actors teach you so much. The scenery, the smell of a thing. You come on the set in the morning to do a scene, whether it's Othello or a modern story, whatever it might be. And if you have a master plan for what you're going to do, exactly where the camera is going to be, exactly what the scene is supposed to state. If you are locked into that, you are depriving yourself of the divine accidents of movie making. Because everywhere there are beautiful accidents. The actor says something in a different way than you ever dreamed it could be said. She looks differently. There's a smell in the air. There's a look that changes the whole resonance of what you expected. And then there are the true accidents. And my definition of a film director is the man who presides over accidents. <laughs> but doesn't make them. <laughs> I'm going to stop just here. Not only because our, our time is almost up, but because at this point in the discussion, the uh, Boston film buffs veered away from the subject of Othello. If I've evaded any of their questions, or any of yours, it, it's not by design. Maybe I should have read into the record some of the things the critics have said against Othello. You might have found that informative. I would have found it depressing. And then I'm very much afraid that under the banner of fair play in the interest of what's called a balanced judgment, I couldn't have resisted reading you some of the good stuff as well. <laughs> anyway, it's an argument that still goes on and on. I've spared you both sides of it. I don't know if I was mistaken. Maybe an anthology of critical reviews might have been rewarding, but after all, this was supposed to be my voice on the subject, so that's what you've had. I've tried to be as candid as I can, you won't have expected me to be objective. I started by calling this a, a conversation, but I'm afraid what you've had mostly is a scrambled and disjointed series of notes. I've been coming at our subject from every conceivable direction of the compass, and I, there might have been a better shape to this if I'd relentlessly pursued a single theme, but that would have neglected all the other themes. I just don't know. Tried to say too much, I may have said too little. And now, of course, my film did not do justice to the play. It is my film and Shakespeare's play. No film, indeed, no stage production could ever do true justice to that play. No act ever did full justice to the part. I ask myself now if I've done justice here in my own movie, talking to you, I don't mean in the value I may sometimes rather coyly have placed upon it. I just mean this discussion. Let's try to sum it up. First, how the picture was made, that story. Well, you remember an Italian producer dreaming of Verdi's Otello and 
neglecting to mention that he was about to go into bankruptcy, stranded our whole company in a small town off the coast of Africa, and with a little money of my own, all I had and absolutely no costumes whatsoever. We improvised our way for a while, and then had to stop for a while, and I had to go to work as an actor in other films to earn money enough to continue with my own, and that went on and on and repeated itself several times, and it meant that Othello was made, so to speak, on the installment plan. This and other circumstances did impose a method and a style of shooting which was contrary to what had been carefully planned. And for a description of the finished result, I've drawn tonight on a few of those critical appreciations which correspond fairly closely to my own ideas. Some thoughts on the interpretation have come from a couple of the leading actors with some additions of my own. All judgments having been avoided, I'll leave you with a confession. This hasn't been as easy as I could have wished. There are too many regrets, too many things I wish I could have done over again. If it wasn't a memory, if it was a project for the future, talking about Othello would have been nothing but delight. Promises are more fun than explanations. With all my heart, I wish that I, I wasn't looking back on Othello, but looking forward to it. That Othello would be one hell of a picture. Good night.